We know that everybody's time is valuable, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Dr. Michael Chambers is an assistant professor at the Center for Ocean Renewable Energy housed at the University of New Hampshire. He's been working with open ocean farming technologies for over 30 years in both the, Auburn, uh, both the US and abroad. In the US, he managed cage culture projects in the Gulf of Mexico, Hawaii, and the North Atlantic. And more recently, he's been developing and training fishermen on small scale integrated multi-trophic aquaculture of steelhead trout, blue mussels, and sugar kelp on floating platforms. Additional efforts at the University of New Hampshire include development of novel submerged mussels, seaweed, and sea scallop techniques that can minimize potential entanglement of marine creatures. Again, we thank you all for your time and participation. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Chambers. Thank you very much, David. I really appreciate the introduction and I appreciate the opportunity here to, to share some of the results from our IMTA research here in the Gulf of Maine with the US Aquaculture Society. Um, quick correction on, on my uh, title. I, I have a number of titles at UNH and that was one of them, but my real title right now is research professor associate professor at the School of Marine Science and Ocean Engineering. So with that, um, I'd like to share um, some of the experiences we've been conducting here, uh, raising sugar kelp, blue mussels, and steelhead trout from a floating platform. Before I get started though, I'd like to acknowledge many, many people that have been involved with this project for the last 10 years. Uh, without them, this wouldn't be possible. It's a broad variety of people, including professors from UNH, uh, field uh, engineers and biologists, industry partners, uh, a number of fishermen that have trained with us and are currently training with us, the outlets that actually purchase the items that we produce and, and bring to the local restaurants, and certainly the permitting agencies that uh, we didn't have their guidance, we wouldn't be able to um, conduct any of this work, and then certainly the funding agencies, including NOAA Sea Grant, New Hampshire Sea Grant, and Salt and Stall Canada. So a little background uh, about myself before we get started is as a, a marine biologist and a diver, I, I had a unique attraction to offshore aquaculture for those reasons. And, and as a biologist, I really wanted to study the water, but I also wanted to see what we could grow in the water and perhaps even sell it in the day to, to profit from it. So during my master's at Texas A&M in, in Corpus Christi, I was able to um, come onto a project with Occidental Petroleum Company, and they had access to uh, platforms near shore Texas, about seven miles offshore, in fact, uh, where we were able to develop, design, and construct small cages that we could attach onto the legs of the riser of the oil platforms. And with that, we developed uh, automatic feed systems that would be placed into containers and, and craned on top and utilized solar power to deliver feed and, and water down to the fish below surface. And, and that was the real uh, first project that I was able to cut my teeth on, on offshore aquaculture. And there we were able to raise red drum in Florida Pompano and bring them into markets in ports, um, uh, Port Aransas in, in Texas. For that project, I was hired on at the Oceanic Institute on Oahu, and they had interest in funding uh, from uh, Hawaii Sea Grant to develop an offshore project as well. There we secured a site on the leeward side of Oahu uh, we brought in a, a sea station fish cage and we set stocked out a juvenile Pacific threadfin, otherwise known as moi in Hawaii. It's a local delicacy. It's a small white flaky fish that is quite popular there. Um, and we will uh, conduct two trials there and, and gather necessary data that then was passed over to a commercial farm that took the, the uh, site on over and I think it ended up going up to maybe eight cages uh, and growing moi there. And then finally in 2000, I packed up the bags, jumped on the plane with my family and came to New Hampshire where they had a, a open ocean aquaculture project that was funded by NOAA. And the nine year project uh, had us work with a number of collaborators without the New England region. We were able to permit a 30 acre site about nine miles offshore and in, in 185 feet of water depth. Um, because this was exposed to the Northeast, we would have Northeast storms that would come in with 
currents over two knots and seas well over 30, 30 feet. Um, so all the technology we developed was to survive at this site. And the cages we, we focused on were submersible cage technologies. And we tested probably six or seven different systems there. Um, the beautiful thing about when you escape the surface and get down below surface, the infrastructure and the livestock are, are really protected from that wave energy. And so we were able to raise cod haddock and halibut there. In addition to that, we raised uh, blue mussels and um, some different types of mackerel algae species. <clears throat> so obviously with my attraction to offshore aquaculture, I started to put things into focus. And, and certainly as you look from our planet from outer space, it, it truly makes sense because we are 70% water. Um, but yet we all more or less live and, and uh, develop food um, from land, terrestrial animals, and, and we utilize fresh water. But when you get in the open ocean, uh, you don't have uh, those types of, of parameters. Um, but um, it certainly makes a lot of sense to go in this area where a lot of people really aren't in this space. This is certainly further as you get away from shore, not coastal areas, which can be quite crowded. But also looking at our, our food and how we're gonna produce enough protein in the future, it's very important to look at this environment because our, our natural fisheries have plateaued uh, at about 100 million metric tons since 1990. And, um, we just cannot take anything more from the ocean, otherwise we won't have anything left there. Um, currently we're importing over 90% of the seafood we consume in the United States with an annual deficit exceeding $14 billion. And about half of that sets that percentage of seafood is farm grown, um, but it's grown in areas that we may not be aware of what the environmental um, characteristics are. And that's one thing that's nice about EPA in the United States and FDA is we do have a high standard of regulations that secures the safety of our, of our seafood. And certainly, um, as we look forward uh, into 2050, we're going to have to produce a lot more seafood uh, to maintain uh, people on this planet. So um, these are some of the main reasons that really has pulled me to this direction of farming the ocean. Um, the other reasons I think are quite important to make people realize is that uh, when you're farming offshore in the ocean, you don't utilize fresh water as crops do, plants and animals do on, on land. And that's really important as we look towards the future and are we gonna have enough fresh water for humans uh, and as well as crops and, and, and animals. The other interesting fact is that animals grown in the aquatic media uh, typically have better feed conversion ratios. More or less that's how much feed you have to feed it per pound of flesh gain. And in the aquatic media, it, it's quite good. It's usually one to one, one to two, um, in, um, in, in crops, well, I should say animals such as chickens, it's, it's about three to one. Um, cows, it's closer to nine to 10 to one. So there are efficiencies that allow things to grow faster and more efficiently in these aquatic environments. So let's circle back to where we began, uh, talking about integrated multi-trophic aquaculture. Essentially, uh, this is uh, an aquaculture method that utilizes fed species, such as fin fish, to produce nutrients that feed lower trophic species, such as shellfish, seaweeds, and even benthic critters. Um, and in this process, uh, the inorganic and organic nutrients can be absorbed from the environment, creating less of an impact from those nutrients from the fish. Um, when the fish are not excreting, the lower trophic species are still there filter feeding. So they have ecosystem benefits by taking additional nitrogen, phosphorus, other elements from the water particulate matter to clean up that area and space. And one of the forefathers of this is Terry Chapin. Chopin. Um, this is a diagram he produced and, and he's somebody I follow regularly. He's a, a real champion in this area. If you haven't heard from him, you should certainly look up online. So <clears throat> we know it's good for the environment. We know it can feed other lower trophic species, but there's other benefits to it as well too. Um, I mentioned the ecosystem services uh, that it provides for the environment, um, but also if you have a, a permitted farm space, uh, whether it's an acre or 50 acres, uh, you can better utilize that space by going into this 3D dimension of utilizing the bottom, the middle water column and the surface area. 
um, by growing additional species, some that you don't have to feed that are filter feeders. Uh, this increases the profitability by having other, other species to sell. Um, and this sometimes can be beneficial during different times of the year when you might not be harvesting a fish per se. Um, also, uh, IMTA is, is more socially acceptable and favored by regulatory bodies because of the low impact to the environment. And in some cases, and what we're trying to do to a certain degree is trying to break down the permitting barriers related to fish aquaculture uh, by growing other species together with them. So one of our approaches <clears throat> since about 2010 was to look at small scale aquaculture as opposed to the giant sort of large scale farm offshore. And reasons for that is that during that time, there was changes within the law. Um, There's regulations that decreased uh, the taking of marine fin fish, uh, decreased uh, bag limits. And so the fishermen were sort of in trouble and not sure what to do. And so with that, we uh, started to look at small scale farming systems that would be user-friendly, easy for them to adopt the technology, easy for them to you know, moor up next to and, and maintain the system. Um, and we wanted to look at a system that uh, could grow multiple species. So if there were concerns with over nitrification to the system, this could help alleviate that. So the basic concept we came upon was to grow three notable species in our area that are easily accessed and they include blue mussels, steelhead trout, and sugar kelp. And the way this works is that we have the two bays that have fishnets where we stock out juvenile steelhead trout. Um, and then we suspend the mussels and the kelp or other seaweeds from dropper lines that are attached to the floating platform that are around the nets. So they're basically like a, a, a biological blanket that can take the nutrients as soon as they're released. And again, if, if the fish aren't uh, releasing nutrients, then they can take other nutrients from the environment uh, as they can. And to go a step further on this, to better understand it, uh, our research and our modeling uh, based upon the nitrogen that we put in via the fish feed, uh, some of that nitrogen is retained in the flesh of the fish Nitrogen is, is taken up by the, the shell and the flesh of the mussel, and it's also taken up by the seaweed species. And what we found after approximate analysis is that uh, you need a three to one ratio to become more or less nitrogen neutral to the environment. In other words, you need about three ton of shellfish or seaweed or a combination of both to every ton of fish to become nitrogen neutral. <clears throat> and so with this, this sort of paper model, we set out to build a system that could do just that. And our, our first system uh, was funded by Noah Saltonstall Kennedy um, and incorporated a, a small scale prototype raft where we could demonstrate uh, the production of two tons of fish, five tons of mussels, and one ton of sugar kelp. Um, and uh, what allows us to do this is we have a real um, experienced engineering department where they're developing tools for the last 20 years to help develop systems to go offshore that are structurally sound and moored properly so they can survive the environments. And some of these tools include aqua finite element modeling that we have uh, on a computer where we can take these systems, design them, set the parameters in, and then we can throw waves, we can throw currents at them, and the computer will simulate that sort of real world environment. And we can look at the weak points where things might be bending too much, there could be high loading, and then we could try to resolve that in the next design before moving forward. When we're happy with the, the software modeling, then the next step is actually to build a physical scale model. And we have a 100 foot uh, tow tank uh, at the Jared Chase Ocean Engineering Laboratory where we'll build this prototype small scale system and throw it in there and generate waves and currents and, and again, do a visual uh, uh, sort of uh, identification of weak spots uh, in the system, system areas that might be of current so we can, again, reinforce it so it, it uh, bodes better when it gets offshore. And the third phase then is to actually um, build the system and take it offshore and evaluate there. Uh, 
Um, and, and typically when you do that, we'll add load cells to the system so we can actually document what sort of loads we might see in the cage system or in the mooring lines. And so this is all uh, very beneficial information as we develop newer systems as we move forward and, and going offshore with aquaculture. And so the, the first prototype was built up at uh, JPS Industries in Bristol, New Hampshire. They uh, basically produce this in two parts that could be easily trucked down, uh, bolted together on shore and craned in the water. And um, you can see by the photo on the right that the small size of it is, is quite manageable with small vessels. That's a 22 foot boat that pushed it offshore to a, a two point mooring site that is um, permitted by the US Army Corps and the New Hampshire Fishing Game to conduct this research. Um, the research site uh, you can see here, I'll put my mouse on it. Uh, this is where the farm's actually located. This is where we grow all three species. Um, notably, we have a number of other aquaculture sites, even though we're a small state with a small coastline, we do have a number of oyster farms up in Great Bay, over 20. Uh, this industry has really grown in recent years. Um, and then we also do have other seaweed and mussel farms in coastal areas in New Hampshire. And then also out here, uh, past the Isle of Shoals is where we had our open ocean aquaculture site. Um, and so uh, these are the active sites that we, we currently are conducting research. The offshore aquaculture site is in a renewal process right now, and we hope to get that renewed in the near future to continue our, our work in that more energetic environment. So how do, how do you culture three species from a folding platform? We, we saw in, in Terry's uh, diagram where they had a salmon farm, they had a, a, a mussel longline area farm, and then uh, seaweed growing, but they weren't on the same platform. And so doing this all together is, is a bit different and unique and a little bit more complicated. And so the process of doing that is essentially um, finding out what fish species is appropriate for your, your area. In, in our case, um, we look towards some of the state hatcheries, uh, private hatcheries in New Hampshire that uh, purchase uh, eyed eggs from Trout Lodge. In particular, the strain we like to work with is a diploid all-female strain. And uh, these eggs are brought in, it takes about two to three weeks for them to hatch on out. <clears throat> And the juveniles then go into uh, two meter circular tanks with fresh water uh, flowing through and fed a, a crumble. Um, and as they get to be about four or five months old, they're later put into a raceway outside with a flow through system and raised to the size that we like to, to gather, uh, which is about 150 grams before taking them out to the sea cages. Of course, they're transferred in, in exactics with aeration and oxygen. Um, in the past, we would bring these fish down and stock them in the spring and raise them through the summer and the fall and, and harvest before winter time, just because that was a, a good time of year for people to be in the water. But we had issues with heat stress with the warming temperatures in the Gulf of Maine and particularly in August, September, the temperatures would get up to over 20 degrees, sometimes 22 degrees Celsius, and uh, we would have some chronic mortality as a result of that. And one of the things we've done in the most recent grow out is to reverse that. And now we do a winter grow out and the fish are doing much better in, in that type of model um, where they're going in when the water's cooling down. They, the steelhead trout, they, they love cold water. And so this is something that we really changed up now that's kind of a game changer for, for what we're doing now. Again, these fish are, are put out in the that pen for about seven months, and uh, we start them off at 150 grams. They're fed a, a, a bio-organ trout diet. Um, <clears throat> now, mussels, this is probably the, the easiest critter to, to grow. Um, it's uh, dominant in the Gulf of Maine. It spawns two, sometimes three times a year, based upon the temperature. Usually around 10 to 11 degrees is what it likes when it spawns. Um, it will settle on pretty much anything. Uh, um, whether you have a cage there or a mooring line, on boats, on lobster pots, if you had your foot in the water long enough, it'd probably settle on that too. So it's, it's very ubiquitous. And we actually will take uh, this green fuzzy rope uh, produced in New Zealand. Uh, we put a weight on one end and we suspend it again around the frame of the floating platform and seed will settle on there. 
twice a year. And you can see initially when it settles out and then as it starts to grow, how uniform it is. And we typically will take this up to about 30 pounds per meter before harvesting. And it takes about 16 to 18 months to get it to harvestable size, which is about 55 millimeters in, in length. Sugar kelp is a little bit more difficult. Um, it again is ubiquitous and sort of grows everywhere. Uh, it really likes to attach onto the HTPE floating frame. And this is this is the wild kelp here that, that recruits naturally. And then we also have vertical lines underneath this. But we take this, this wild kelp <laughs> as it grows and it starts to produce sorus tissue. We remove that sorus tissue and we bring it into the lab. We clean it up with iodine, we dehydrate it overnight in a refrigerator, pull it back out, and we slowly warm it up uh, to ambient seawater temperature, which is about um, 60, 65 degrees. And during this process, it will release spores into the water. The, the water sort of turns like a, a brown color, looking like tea. And then we, we take those spores, we pour them into this aquarium that has PVC pipe that has twine wrapped around it. And they're inserted into these little other larger scale PVC pipes with water in them. We put the spores in there and we cover it and then we let them settle overnight. And then we remove the, the seed line into the aquarium and provide flow through and light. And this is where uh, gametes will, will form and it will start to grow into juvenile sugar kelp. And the process takes about six to eight weeks uh, before we will then take these little uh, PVC pipes and we hang them from a pier where it continually can grow to a, a size which you see right here. And then from there, we'll take this PVC pipe, run a line through it, and then attach it onto the line and then just zip up and down that line and you can unspool that line right onto your culture line. It works really effectively. <clears throat> this kind of gives you a better sense of what it looks like. Um, the kelp droppers, we, we weed them off so they don't entangle, same with the mussels. And um, the mussels, are, again, they're, you know, it's a year round crop, it goes for 16, 18 months. Sugar kelp is a, is a seasonal winter crop. We stock that out in, in November and we'll harvest early spring. And, and now that's sequenced well with the fish as they grow out through the winter months and into the spring. In addition to growing the, the kelp, from the aquafort raft, we um, also have uh, kelp long lines uh, next to the system. And this is where we can create higher densities. They'll actually get longer and thicker. And we use this for training uh, people, fishermen that have interest in, in kelp farming. And this system is about 65 meters long. It uh, stays about three meters below surface. And again, this line is seeded on that, grown over the wintertime, harvested in the spring. So what we learned with the, the prototype, uh, we applied towards another grant that was funded by NOAA Sea Grant. And we created the second generation, which we call the Aquafort. This one is, is larger scale, more robust, uh, can handle greater waves. And if taken offshore in the deeper water, could produce up to 40 ton of shellfish and finfish. And I'm happy to say we've just completed our, our first uh, winter grow with this system. Um, we were hoping to take this thing offshore, um, but we we're not able to get permits in time uh, due to uh, concerns with the northern right whales. So we kept it closer to shore um, where we could conduct the winter grow out. Um, as a result, uh, and being in, in water that's only about 35 feet deep, our fish nets were only 15 feet deep. So we couldn't produce the the amounts that we would have liked to in deeper waters with deeper water nets and deeper muscle lines. We were able to demonstrate the, the effectiveness though of the system and the species all culture together. So this is the trout. The, in this photo, they're probably close to a kilo in size. Um, in that seven month period of time, we were able to take them up to close to two kilos. So they're very, very fast growing, even despite uh, the winter months uh, when they were grown at temperatures of, of as low as three degrees Celsius. They continued to eat. We never, we never lost any weight with them, which was notable. Um, again, you know, early on they were fed about 1%, I'm sorry, 3% body weight per day uh, when they're 150, 200 grams. And then eventually we worked their way up to about 1% uh, 
body weight per day as, as they got over a kilogram. Um, in, initially, when they were stocked out, we'd feed twice a day. And then as they got larger, once a day. And then in the wintertime, as we got down to three degrees, we would feed twice a week. So it um, took less, less uh, labor to maintain them uh, during those colder months. And <clears throat> as a result, um, this is the harvest of, of the uh, fish. We, we did weekly harvest, partial harvest, where we would use a seine net and pull out a portion of the fish and then uh, sort of collect the larger ones, allowing the, the smaller ones to stay back and continually to grow out. Um, these fish were euthanized in an ice water bath and we would then uh, bleed them and gut them, uh, clean them with uh, uh, fresh seawater and then pack them on ice into totes that you see on the left there. Those can hold about up to about 100 pounds. We normally would put about 80 pounds in them and then we could transfer them to the different marketplaces, outlets in, in Portsmouth and in Boston. <clears throat> now, in addition to um, teaching fishermen how to, to grow seafood, it's, it's also been a unique platform um, to bring students out, classes out, to do field trips and, and let them see up close how things can be grown. And um, having this relatively close to shore, it makes it easy to get out there and um, interest of restaurants, um, they bring out their staff, uh, wait staff, their chefs, managers to, to look at this. And then um, some of them, or most of them, will actually then end up buying this and putting it on their menu and serving it to the customers. So it's nice to have a story behind your seafood that is locally produced in New Hampshire uh, and not um, produced someplace overseas that has to be sent, sent in via a plane or, or vessel. So. That is a nice story. And we've also been working with Portsmouth Brewery. They've been uh, taking the kelp and they turn it into a kelp brew called Selkie, uh, which is quite notable and seasonal uh, during the summer and fall months in, in the local area. Now, in addition to uh, training and education, <clears throat> research and demonstration, we are utilizing the platform to develop uh, technologies where we can learn more about marine mammals that might be in the vicinity. Uh, we're working with a company called Synthetic, and they have developed a, a marine mammal monitoring system um, that is on, on our cage system right now. It includes two hydrophones that are below the surface that you can't see, and then two video cameras on top. And it uses artificial intelligence to take collect data, both video-wise and sound-wise, to determine uh, if a marine mammal may be in the area and approximately how many and or how far away they might be from the system. And it utilizes um, a computer that, that sends this to a cell phone and it, it collects the data there and notifies the person with the cell phone that a, a whale is in the vicinity, which is notable for researchers that might wanna go out and, and you know, make sure that there aren't any issues between the moorings and, and these animals. And also to, to notify the Coast Guard that a marine mammal may be in the area and. and to notify mariners to, to slow down uh, so there won't be any vessel strikes. In addition to working with this new tool, we're, we're developing composite culture lines for kelp aquaculture. And these are very different than the typical traditional polyester or, or nylon rope. And this is uh, uh, sort of, a, it's a fiber grade, not fiber grade, it's a fiberglass rebar. Uh, and it has great tensile strength but it's a bit like raw spaghetti. And if you bend raw spaghetti, it goes to a certain point and then it breaks. And so the idea is if a whale were to run into this, instead of it breaking and wrapping around the whale, as it breaks, it, it doesn't sort of wrap around the flukes or fins of, of the whale. And so it could uh, swim through it without concern of entanglement. And so um, we're funded by World Wildlife Foundation to investigate this material and other materials that ultimately could be more whale friendly in the Gulf of Maine. <clears throat> and then our local markets are, are quite good, I would say. Um, traditionally and typically, we take the trout out and um, we cut them, leave the heads on, and we get prices of between seven, five to seven dollars per pound in this form. Um, we also have been taking them to uh, a live market down in Boston where they pay $5 a pound. Um, 
this is not sort of the typical market, um, but we do feel there's potential here. It seems like the live market has more interest in white flesh fish than uh, the pink uh, colored flesh. And this is mostly to going to Asian markets. And the nice thing about the live trout market, or any live trout market is there's no um, putting them on ice and gutting them and bleeding them. It's much cleaner, faster, and you get paid the full price of everything in the fish, not just a part of the fish. So we, we kind of like that and would like to look at opening up additional markets in, in this area. Mussels are certainly a local delicacy. Uh, most of our mussels come from PI Canada, some come from New Zealand. Um, the mussel farmers in Maine, uh, they sell everything they have. There's a lot of room for uh, mussel production offshore. Um, and um, so this, this is a, a fair price for, for the mussels that are grown there. And the kelp in bulk, um, you can typically get about 65 cents a pound for it. This is wet weight. Um, and this is taken up to Atlantic Sea Farms in Maine, where they produce uh, noodles, kimchi, and, and slaw. And then a portion of the kelp does go to uh, Portsmouth Brewery, where it's then uh, turned into sulky beer. So the economics of this are very, very important. And, you know, getting just done with this recent harvest, we're, we've got all the data, we're, we're crunching it right now. Um, we have a, an economist that's going to help us you know, create the numbers uh, to look at the feasibility of this with, with the current size and, and amount of production. Um, what I would say is that you know, the economics are going to be variable based upon um, the water depth. Certainly, um, in our case, uh, with our nets only being 15 feet deep, we could produce about seven ton of fish per net. So a total of about 15,000 pounds uh, in one garage cycle of this system. If you had nets that were 50 foot deep, you could triple that production. And so that's something that's, that's notable uh, if you want to be more profitable. Certainly the mussel lines and the kelp lines can also be longer and deeper. So you increase production with those as well too. Um, other things are, are markets. Markets can be very tricky. And when we had fewer fish, we'd sell them for $7 a pound. As we started to have more fish available, uh, the prices started to drop. And so. You have to watch your markets and, and try to make sure you, you get a fair price for, for your efforts. And then uh, fingerling costs, having a secure available source of, of fingerlings is really important. So you can have continual production, uh, labor, feed, and of course, vessel, fuel, and insurance are other factors that you have to consider into the economic package. So what we learned this last year, which was quite important, is um, the winter grout versus the summer grout. And we we're very pleased because the winter uh, environment is very different. Uh, fishermen stop fishing for the most part, so there's less lobster pots on the water, uh, less boat traffic, reduced temperatures, reduced sunlight. We had less biofouling. We didn't have to clean our net at all until the following spring. Uh, with uh, decreased temps and, and light as well, the sea lice wasn't an, an issue. Uh, in the summertime, it can be an issue, and, and to overcome that, we'll have to net our fish out and put them into freshwater bass, and, and that will take care of the lice quite quickly. Um, we also found that putting the fish out as temperatures are, are, are decreasing allowed for a, a much faster and better acclimation, and that's always been a challenge when setting the fish out in early spring with temperatures coming on up. And we also found in the, the, the overall culture period, survival was very higher. Survival was 96%. In, in both systems. And so um, that was uh, much different than when we were doing the summer grow. It's where we had 80% uh, survival. Um, also notable is, is that we did not lose weight in the winter times, despite the three degree Celsius temperatures. Um, that's important. Um, so um, we're not wasting time just by maintaining them there. And then as the temperatures came up in the spring, we had accelerated growth. We could not get enough feed into these fish. And one of our concerns as we moved into the summertime is we knew the temperatures were gonna be coming up again. And we thought, well, we're gonna have heat stress as we've had before with the fish. And in this case, because the trout had been there for five, six months and acclimated to that net environment, acclimated to that saltwater environment, they were able to acclimate to the increased temperatures as they came up. And we did not have any mortality from heat stress. And so that was something that was very interesting and we were surprised about. 
And so you could take your fish longer into the summer, even maybe to the fall and continually grow them to a larger size, maybe up to four kilograms. Um, so that's um, something of interest. And in, in if you're going to conduct this type of, of aquaculture, you really need to look at your temperatures and when best to grow them, whether you're down in New York or if you're up in, in uh, Maine or Canada, the temperature profile is really important. <clears throat> So uh, real quick, I'll get through this. This is just some of the typical steps that I would advise people if, if you're wanting to get involved with this type of aquaculture is you really have to look at the permitting landscape in your individual state. It varies from state to state. Um, very important to pick adequate sites that are semi-protected um, and to make sure those sites are not in an area that's heavily fished or uh, recreational recreational boaters are, are going through this area, you want to make sure you, you're a good friend um, and, and be careful as to where you put the system in. Before anything uh, gets too far down the road, you have to talk to local community, the fishermen in particular, and the regulatory authorities, uh, what steps you have to make uh, so you can secure uh, your, your business plan. Um, you also have to develop cage and mooring plans, containment management plans, uh, where you're going to get your seed stock from, um, daily feed plans, operational plans, um, on and on. And uh, also important is to make sure that as you start growing this stuff, that you have a good market outlet and that uh, when you get your product to the, to the front door of that, that market outlet, that they don't say, oh, I'm just going to give you $3 a pound. You got to make sure you can firm up a, an adequate price where you can make money doing this. Um, and you have to have a, a secure business plan. And uh, as I say, and I think anybody in aquaculture knows, you should always secure at least five years of funding before you venture forward with a business such as this. Um, <clears throat> right now, uh, we see a lot of viability of this technology in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, in particular, Maine itself has a lot of nearshore protected areas where this could be placed uh, and fishermen could adopt this or other people could adopt this. Um, we find that the fishermen we work with, lobster fish in the spring, summer, and fall, and they pull out in the wintertime, and they're not doing as much during the wintertime. So again, this is when this would uh, be active, and it kind of uh, would offset um, the, their downtime by taking care of this system in the winter and spring before harvest. And we certainly see this as a way fishermen can diversify their income and do this either part-time or full-time. Um, currently, we're working with people in New Hampshire and Maine to get permits. And we're also are involved with projects uh, interested in, in doing the same sort of grow out technology in New York, in the Gulf of Mexico, Mexico and Alabama, and uh, right now in Puerto Rico as well. So we hope to see this go other places besides New Hampshire. Um, also, we're uh, um, expanding our, our permit right now to look at other finfish, shellfish species in our area. Um, they include sea scallops, which actually we have been growing out there and have been quite well in ladder nets suspended around the aquaculture uh, frame. Um, other species that could do well include the eastern oyster and baleen oyster, which is uh, notable for being a higher salinity oyster. We have quite a bit of those in the New Hampshire coastline. Other high value seaweed species include dulls. And um, we do have interest. We have a researcher at UNH, David Berlinski, who does a lot of work with land-based restricting aquaculture of striped bass. And this could perhaps be a, a summer fall species to grow um, in the system when the trout are not there. So again, another interesting species to work with. And then we've also considered this technology for um, other warmer tropical areas such as the Caribbean. And we've been in contact with several island states down there for this. And I think the fun part with IMPA is trying to figure out what species you would try to grow in each particular area. And these are some species here that you know, would be typical for the Gulf of Mexico. Some of these maybe could be used down in the Caribbean. Um, certain species like Gracilaria sargasm. There's mangrove oysters down in Puerto Rico and Cuba. And then there's a, a number of benthic organisms that could come on in and, and take up some of the nutrients as well in the bottom. So this is something we hope to get more involved with in the future and to bring this to other, other places. The other thing too, I, I would say, um, and you know, in, in the Caribbean, when you have uh, strong hurricanes that come through, 
Um, if you site this well in a protected area <clears throat> and it's built properly, it can survive these storms. And, and when these storms come through, a lot of times the power is off for, for weeks on end and, and anything in the refrigerators goes bad. So having something that's still there, not utilizing electricity that can survive and still have live animals to feed upon could be a benefit um, to help secure uh, uh, live food for, for people on the island. Um, I'd like to talk about some of the challenges we've encountered. Um, as with any project, we have a number of them. Permitting is, is always a challenge. Um, now we find it's more of a, of a challenge as we go further offshore, deeper waters where the northern right whale is of great concern because of its decreased populations. And so um, the permitting uh, is, is more difficult to secure. Um, we are working on resecuring our offshore permit, and we hope to have that in, in uh, another year or so so that we can go off and, and use that site for, for other types of, of development or research in the open ocean. Um, social license is, is also another issue. Um, if you're gonna bring this someplace, some people may not like this in their backyard. Some people may not mind. Um, misinformation is another issue that we deal with, particularly when growing fish. We've had firsthand results from an NGO that, um, called our research offshore uh, industrial farming complex and um, hard to, to see it that way when it's so small, working with individual or different types of, of species. But these are some of the things you face uh, when you try to get permits. Um, interestingly enough, uh, eider ducks is a problem with our shellfish. They can come in for a couple of days and take out all the mussels. And so we've, uh, we've taken care of this with putting out um, protective netting around the mussel droppers. Uh, during the winter months. And this now has protected them and allowed them to grow to, to market size. And then uh, the other issue too that we're always concerned about is increasing water temperatures uh, everywhere. And, and certainly we see it in the Gulf of Maine and um, how do we deal with this? Do we have to move further offshore into deeper waters where the waters are cooler is, is one way to, to look at this and moving forward. And then lastly here in my next two slides, I'm just gonna plug UNH a little bit. Um, wonderful place to, to work at. They have had a number of years of experience exploring offshore aquaculture. They have the tools such as their modeling and physical scale testing uh, that they can take and put in order uh, for different types of research projects. We have incredible infrastructure as far as boats, docks, um, vessels, um, and we have a strong team of engineers and biologists and industry partners that work with us in developing this technology. So if anybody has interest in, in teaming up with us, we're, the doors were right open and we look forward to doing so. And then lastly here, <clears throat> uh, as I had spoke earlier, we're, we're still uh, wanting to secure our offshore uh, permitted farm. And, and this is what we call sort of an, an offshore technology park, where we want to secure a general permit so we can look at wave energy. We can look at developing instrumentation or real-time envi environmental monitoring or past acoustic hydrophones to listen to whales as they go. Basically a, a learning farm um, that we can develop tools that'll better allow us to understand the ocean environment, what can survive, what can be grown, and how to do it in a responsible manner that we don't harm anything out there. So this is our, our big mission that we're working on next, and uh, hope we can uh, get this in the water. And if any company out there has interest in, in trying to uh, develop or demonstrate a technology, uh, this is a place to do it. So we look forward to talking to you if you have interest. And I will Gladly take questions now, although we have a video we wanted to show you. It's about five minutes on the IMT system. David, do you think you could start that up? Yes. Uh, did you stop sharing your screen? I just did. Okay. Let's see. Share some. Okay, here we go. Let me, can you see that? Did it change? Yep, we can see it. Okay, here we go. There's great potential in the United States because we have so much water that ranges from American Samoa in the Pacific to you know, the Virgin Islands that are federal waters that could be farmed. Just offshore of Newcastle, we have a, a small site that grows sugar kelp, steelhead trout, blue mussels, and this year we'll have a few sea scallops. 
Early on when we were trying to grow fish here, our experiments were focused on trout behavior. Fishermen would stop by and say, hey, what are you doing with those sea pens? What's in there? And we'd show them the trout. And that's where we decided that this might be something for them. I'm uh, Ward Byrne. I'm the captain and owner of the vessel Sugar Daddy. I uh, lobster fish, I tuna fish, and as of the past two years, I've been involved with the uh, UNH Aquafort Steelhead Trout Program. I had no idea what I was getting into, but I said yes, and uh, I'm glad I did. The partnerships we're trying to develop with the lobstermen and with the local industry, the working waterfront, it is crucial. They're stakeholders in the environment. We would love to work very closely with them to introduce this technology, to introduce training. And it's the wider community that we're wanting to work with. So they are the forefront of the working waterfronts within New Hampshire. And so we started looking at the permitting process. But in this case, uh, EPA stepped in and said, well, we have concerns about nutrients from the fish going in this river, and this river already has too many nutrients. We went back to the, the chalkboard, scratched our heads a little bit, and said, well, if nutrients is what they're concerned about, what can we grow in addition to the trout that could pull those nutrients out of the water? The fish nets are inside the floating platform. The perimeter of the platform, we can put in these lines that have weights, and then we create this biological curtain around the fish that then are eating the, the organic and the non-organic elements that, that are being released by the fish. For every ton of fish we produce, we have to produce three ton of kelp or mussels or a combination of both. It becomes a nitrogen neutral model. So we had done this for a while and, and we uh, enjoyed it and, and it worked and we got most of the kinks out. And we're thinking about what are we going to do next? Uh, maybe we should try something different. And we're about to maybe, I wouldn't say we're closing down the farm, but we're going to try something else. That's when someone came running down the pier and said, hey, uh, we want to buy this fish in, in bulk because it's, it's amazing. And we had just, um, we, we never considered the fact that the fish was good. We, we just wanted to, to grow it and see if we can get a clean, nice product out there and deliver it to market. Trout are, are very uh, robust. They're temperature tolerant. Uh, they grow quickly, and when grown in seawater, the flavor is spectacular. And all the fish that we brought to market uh, sell quickly, and people are always looking for more once we have harvested the cages. This platform was built in the mind that it was a size and scale, and it could be located in an area where fishermen could stop by on their way to their fishing ground to feed the fish, and then as they came back from a long day at sea, could stop and maybe do some maintenance or harvest the fish and bring them to marketplace. The key here has been that this is a local thing, that this is something that's born and raised in New Hampshire, never leaves the state. It hatched in Ossipi, New Hampshire, it came down. We took it out to the farm. We fed it a very nice, clean diet. Uh, we took care of them. They lived in a natural environment. We harvest them in a very humane and, and clean way. Two hours later, they're in the, in the store. Fishermen have interest in this, but they want to look at how much time commitment's involved, how challenging it is, the ups and downs of it, and then financially, at the end of the day, are they going to make money? Growing anything in the ocean is challenging. There's a very harsh environment. Uh, there are all sorts of rules and regulations to follow, and, and we're just uh, chipping away at it. Uh, every successful harvest or every conclusion of a harvest, it's, it's, a, it's another victory. A lot of the fishermen have, uh, and my friends see my posts on Facebook, usually once a week when we do a harvest or we're out there, I'll do a post, and you know, they saw the fish in, I think, October 21st of 2020. We stalked them, and they saw them when they were small. There was a lot of questions, and then now they see them and like, you know, wow. If they can see the value of this, and then hopefully one day maybe have their own little farm and do this, and or their, their sons and daughters come up and will have their own farm at some point in time too. We can make it work. We can find this economics. We can produce something sustainable to just supplement their incomes. Oh, if this thing, you know, could take off, I think it would be huge. You know, I think it is taking off. So in seven months, transform these fish into uh, food, and it's pretty good. It's really good. Uh, if you look at 
New Hampshire, we have a very small coastline. You go to Maine, beautiful coastline, lots of islands where you have areas that are semi-protected. That's where this really has a lot of opportunity to go to. Hopefully we're gonna grow this to, to, to a movement and, and hopefully deploy it in other parts of the world. And it's been incredibly satisfying to go to the Caribbean nation and just walk in there and see what they're growing and see how they're experiencing the concept. I think currently in the United States, it's challenging to grow fish in cages. And not that aquaculture is perfect, you know, every industry has its issues, but we're trying to do it the best way possible here. And, and I think there are great ways to do it, but you just have to do it right. I believe it's sustainable in the right conditions. I know a lot of farm fish have a bad reputation, and these are not, you know, there's no junk in these pellets that we feed the fish. It would be something to be really proud of to be able to grow fish and bring them from local waters right to the table so locally it'd be pretty cool hopefully we'll see more of this in, in the coastal new england and hopefully uh we'll have more steelhead trout and mussels on our plate when we go out to the restaurants That's a very cool video. Thank you, Michael. Glad you liked it. And yeah, we did have a couple of questions come in. Uh, if you'd like to try and give them a go. Well, the first one was, what kind of dropper ropes are used for natural sediments of mussels in Maine? And you may have covered that, but you might just hit it again. Yeah, there's several different rope types you can get. <clears throat> we call it fuzzy rope, and, and we bring it in from New Zealand. Um, there are a number of uh, companies that sell fuzzy rope uh, in Canada, particularly PEI Canada, um, that you can utilize and hang off a dock and, and you can collect mussels in, in that manner as well too. Um, you can also use just regular line. Uh, typically, um, a new line may not do as well as, a, as an older line. So if you had like old lobster pot line, uh, you could hang that vertically from, from a structure or a pier and that would collect mussels as well too. Very good. The next question we had, and I, you may have covered this one a little bit too, are there any plans to test different combinations of finfish, shellfish, and kelp species? I think um, the one seaweed species we have a lot of interest in is dulse. It has a higher protein content and a higher value, um, such a, a better price. So um, we are working with some scientists in, in Maine, and they're looking at uh, ways to set seed on rope like we do with the sugar kelp. Uh, it's not easy, and, but we hope that in the near future, we'll be able to, to vertically hang that instead of, of kelp. Um, there are other seaweed species you can grow in the summertime. And so that's something to consider as well, uh, summer crop and a winter crop of, of different types of seaweeds. Um, I think we're fairly limited uh, with our fish in New England. Um, trout is, like I said, is a fast growing species, easy to get. Um, when you look at say a cod or haddock or halibut, uh, seed production is, is, you know, we used to have a few entities around that produced them. One was Great Bay Aquaculture. They um, no longer in business, but that was a source that was great um, back 10, 15 years ago. But now that's, that's an issue today. Saltwater, Hatcheries are, are more challenging to get uh, egg to a juvenile size. And so um, the grow out of some of these species, in particular cotton haddock, uh, it takes about three, three and a half years to get them to commercial size. And so that's another factor where trout we can size uh, in a net pen in about seven months. So all important factors that, that uh, dial into the economics of this. Very good. The next one was, what do your oxygen profiles look like at 50 feet? And does the kelp help? Um, I, I can't really say offhand at 50 feet. Um, <clears throat> it's very, you know, typically in, in the wintertime, you know, we have over 10% um, 
milligrams per oxygen, actually higher than that. It could be closer to 11 or 12. In the summertime, it drops down to about maybe eight um, or nine. It's, it's, we have a lot of mixing in, in the coastal areas. We have a lot of water flow. So we've never seen any significant dips in, in oxygen uh, at the farm. So that means, yeah, it's pretty stable then. Right. All right, the next one and possibly the last one. Oh, maybe there's another one. But how many hours or days are required to acclimatize brook trout after transferring from freshwater to seawater? Mm. So there are some species that <clears throat> acclimate much better than others. A steelhead trout, rainbow trout is, is one that is probably one of the betters other than, than salmon. Um, brook trout and brown trout, um, we have had several of those that have been mixed in with our, our rainbow trout and they don't do very well. Uh, they typically die off within the first week. Um, we have done experiments on shore where we, we place uh, the trout into acclimation systems that are like 10 parts per thousand, and we slowly add seawater to bring the 30 parts per thousand. And that also helps too, but it's another sort of um, step that can be expensive in, in doing this. And uh, what we found is you know, by changing the season, when you actually put the fish in the net pen as temperatures are coming down, they acclimate much better and faster to that saltwater environment. Great. And we did have one uh, come in from India, uh, I believe. And it says, please share your opinion, suggestions about, and I don't know if this is a typo, but FIMTA in tropical and developing countries like India. Yeah, I think there's a lot of potential there. I think that's, uh, I would love to see um, a warm water IMTA system put together. And it's really a matter of what species are there, what you can access from a thin fish perspective as well as a, a shellfish perspective and seaweed. And in our case with river species, we just naturally collect and have them recruit on the farm. And so um, you have to look in your individual area, what, what's there, what's of value, what, what do people have interest in? And then you have to figure out ways that you can get it to settle to grow further and take advantage of the nutrients from whatever fin fish species you have. Very good. And last but not least, I think we have one that says, uh, what kind of FCRs did you get and what was the feed price that you had to pay? Uh, FCRs were close to 1.3. Uh, they were pretty good. And uh, the feed prices that we get for our bioorgan trout feed is about 68 cents per pound. And that diet, um, as you're younger, it starts off at about 45% protein and then it goes down to about 39% protein content. Um, it's a good diet. The fish uh, grow very well on it. We're happy with it. What's nice too, and this is important for any place you decide to do this is, is a, a local feed company. And by Oregon, which is owned by Scredding, is up in, in Portland. So it's very accessible to, to us to pick up and bring down to the farm. Very nice. I think that's it for our questions. So I just wanted to thank you again, Michael, for your time and everyone for joining us. And I guess with that, we'll wrap it up. All right. Thank you, David. And thanks for everybody to join today.